Good afternoon. I'm Judy Maggio with KLRU's Decibel. We want to thank you for spending part of your lunch hour with us here on Capital Coffee Talk. And this month, Decibel's been taking a deep dive on the topic that so many of us are talking about, immigration. And we wanted to bring on two people who are really on the front lines dealing with families who've been kind of caught up in, in some of the more recent uh, issues that have ar arisen. But you two have been working in this field for a long, long time, and I'm, probably none of this surprises you. Um, we want to introduce Bob Leibel, who's Executive Director of Grassroots Leadership, and Kate Lincoln Goldfinch, mm -hmm. uh, who is an immigration attorney here from Austin. Um, first of all, tell us, Bob, what your group does, because I don't think a lot of people are aware of grassroots leadership. Sure. So our group is an organizing and advocacy group that uh, works on both criminal justice reform and immigration. Um, and we've been working on issues of immigration detention for 15 years um, uh, since before the opening of the Hutto Detention Center. So one of the things that we do is we send volunteer visitors in to visit women who are detained at the uh, for-profit immigration detention center in Taylor, Texas. Um, the T. Don Hutto. The T. Don Hutto Detention Center. We uh, monitor uh, human rights abuses and we uh, work alongside women there who are organizing to both um, uh, be able to win their asylum cases um, and to uh, lift up some of the, the abuses and stories that are unfortunately all too common in our nation's immigration detention uh, system. And Kate, you probably deal with people on a more one-on-one -on -one basis with clients? Yeah, I'm a private immigration lawyer and I do all types of immigration, deportation defense and humanitarian cases. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years and I got my start at the T. Don Hutto uh, Detention Center as a law student. Um, I, I was asked to do an interview with a family seeking asylum and they were detained there and um, they had a little baby who was wearing a a prison issued onesie and they asked the mother asked me if I would hold her baby because I smelled like the outside world and then she asked me to sneak her baby out of the jail at the end of our meeting um, and that was that that moment changed the trajectory of my career because it it I realized how we were treating our asylum seekers so um, I worked with asylum seeker families in detention for a couple of years and um, have been in private practice, but each time there's a flare-up of an injustice of uh, asylum seekers, I, I get involved again. So when that happened in 2014, family detention came back, um, and of course this most recent round of family separation, um, I you know, get pulled back in. Yeah, I think that's a message that a lot of people don't understand because a lot of the, the critics of the Trump administration say that this is happening for the first time. But in reality, um, families started being detained what year and, and how, you know, can you kind of compare the issues of the Obama administration versus the Trump administration? Because I know there were injustices uh, in, in, in both of them. Sure, uh, so in 2006, Michael Chertoff was the DHS secretary under Bush and he came down to the border and did this big splashy announcement that they were ending the so-called catch and release policy and we're gonna start detaining families um, so as not to separate them. And they put families in the Hutto Detention Center, which is actually named after T. Don Hutto, who's the founder of CoreCivic, which is the largest private prison company in America. And in the same way that we saw not a lot of thought put into what they were doing, the same thing happened in that era, in that families and were just thrown into a prison. And so the, nothing changed about the prison setting in terms of the environment or the rules or the outfits. Um, so there was a lawsuit at that time um, filed by Barbara Hines at the Immigration Clinic and, and um, a few other groups, I think it was the ACLU, wasn't it, um, that settled for improved conditions. So what we saw after that was, was sort of colorful family detention where they would paint murals on the walls and there was more free movement. Um, it was, you know, lipstick on a pig sort of you know I mean it was it was family detention but but it just didn't quite look as prison like um, then Obama took office and ended family detention in August of 2009 and we saw a rise in violence in Central America over the next five years and some more asylum seekers not you know cords of people um, that s sometimes get reported but more asylum seekers from Central America and the Obama administration responded by bringing back family detention again in 2014 um, and and it was 
very problematic. It was babies and kids back in jail, and there was a battle over prolonged detention and whether asylum seekers should be jailed. Um, and then there was, you know, at that point, the, the Flores settlement, which is from the it's 80s. The 20 day limit. Yes. And so it governs children in federal custody. And so there's rules about the environment and the length of detention. And so Flores was applied under the Obama administration in court. Um, and so then we sort of graduated into what we've had over the last few years, which is family detention for asylum seekers, but it generally pretty quick, you know, pretty a few weeks for the most part. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the big, and then of course what happened in May was that the Trump administration decided to separate. to separate. And that, for me and my career, was the most horrific thing I've ever, I've ever witnessed or experienced. I've, I've seen a lot of injustices and, and I have a lot of sad stories um, for, with families in detention, but taking children from their parents is just on a, it's a completely other level. I want to hear some of those individual stories that, that you've heard from your clients and, and witnessed. But I also want to talk to you, Bob, about <clears throat> some letters that I read about that came from women inside the Hutto Detention Center. Now, these are women, some of whom have been separated from their children under the initial policy that was then reversed with that executive order. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, the Hutto Detention Center on any given day detains over 500 women. Um, uh, typically, it's been women who've come to the country either without their kids or they didn't have kids and are seeking asylum. Um, and it's one of the nation's most notorious immigration detention facilities. There's been multiple allegations of sexual abuse um, uh, at the facility. There's been hunger strikes. I mean, it is a, a, a pretty bad place. Um, and so when they started sending women who'd been who'd had their kids taken from them at the border um, uh, to Hutto, uh, our visitation program started going out to visit some of these women. And the women really wanted to get the word out about what was happening in the detention facility. They really wanted to speak for themselves. And so the way that they decided that they wanted to do that was by writing a series of letters to the public describing what had happened to them at the border, um, which is that their kids are taken from them um, by the Border Patrol. Um, they are sent to a criminal court and criminally prosecuted, um, which is the sort of trigger for all of this, that Jeff Sessions made a decision that there would be a mass criminal prosecution of every immigrant who crossed the border. Um, and then they're sent to Hutto, um, oftentimes not knowing if or when they're going to get their kids back. Um, and so these women described uh, that entire process. Um, um, some of them described it as uh, begging for help from people from the outside to pay attention to ensure that the government reunited them with their families. Um, and what we've seen is that there's been an outpouring of support from the community of people who are donating to the Deportation Defense and Bond Fund, who are opening their homes should people be released from detention. And we've started to see many of the women uh, who've spoken out in these letters start to be released from detention. However, they're not yet being reunited from their kids, even if they drive to the detention center for kids where their kids are detained. So they know their children are inside and they're not allowed to get them back? Yeah, that's right. So we had a woman over the weekend who drove to Brownsville after she got out of Hutto. She was allowed a visit to her kid for an hour on Saturday and was told by uh, the government that it could be a week, it could be 30 days before uh, they released her kid to her, um, even though she was literally coming to the facility and saying, I'm here to pick up my kid. Mm -hmm. I want you to share some of your stories, Kate, that I, uh, when we covered the rally uh, a few weeks ago in Austin, um, you said that families are kind of being misled when they take their children, or what, what was happening there? Yeah, there was a progression. You know, um, the I think the policy was implemented and there wasn't, you know, sort of policies and procedures. We're going to separate the place. parents and children, but we don't have a system in place to reunite, kind right. of? Right, or even we're not going to have a system of separation, so we're just going to issue this edict and then the Border Patrol officers are going to figure it out. Um, and we hear stories, I hear, and I'm sure Bob does as well, repeated stories from women about the treatment at these Border Patrol centers is just abysmal. So what what happened in the beginning was the Border Patrol officers were, you know, physically taking the children. Um, so nursing babies were taken from mothers. Um, I represent a woman who um, has a five-year-old and she was told she was holding her son and she was told we're taking him 
uh, to the other side. He can't stay with you. And she grabbed him and, and started crying and said, I don't want you to take my son. And her son started crying. They were both crying. And the Border Patrol officer you know, physically pulled the boy out of her arms and took him away. And it was um, almost two months until she saw him again. She was just reunited with him last week. Um, but then we saw a progression. You know, I, the Border Patrol officers figured out that if they don't tell the parents that they're separating them, that they won't cause a scene. So they started to trick them and say things like, I'm going to take your baby um, for a photo or, or a shower. Um, or one common story that we hear is, oh, we're taking you to court. You're going to get processed in court, and it'll take a day or two, which was true. Um, and your child will be here when you get back. We can't take the kids to court, so your kid's going to mm -hmm. stay here and wait for you. They were never there when they got back. Um, and and is so, this when they were taken to some of the, the detention centers for, they're just for children? Uh, yes. Then they were taken into custody with the Office of Refugee Resettlement all over the country and transferred all over the country. Um, and um, I think those are, for me, those have been the most horrific stories. I, I think because I'm a mother of small children and just listening to a mom talk about having her children taken from her and uh, how traumatic it is. It's, I mean, it's on, a, it's on a level that I never imagined. So what are the hurdles now to, to reunify? Because I know that today is the deadline that children under five were supposed to be, under a federal judge's order, reunited um, with their parents. What is the latest on that and, and what are the hurdles that we're facing now? So it appears that the administration is aiming to reunify the cases for the parents who are accepting deportation orders. Um, so they, we've seen them have, they have a form that says, you know, on its face it says, check this box if you want to be deported with your kid, check this box if you want to be deported without your kid. But the way that it's presented to the parents is, if you want your kid back, fill out this form. So people are being coerced into giving up their asylum claims so for purposes of reunification. And so we're seeing transfers of parents and children down to the valley, to the Port Isabel area. But that's only for the people who are um, giving up their asylum claims. For the, for the people who are pursuing their asylum claims, there, there seems to be no effort toward reunification by the deadline. And an example is the woman that Bob was talking about. I represent another woman who, um, it's the same story. She passed her credible fear interview, got out of detention, went up to New York. Um, her kids are in shelter, and I spoke with her, the social worker yesterday, and she said, um, if she wants to submit the paperwork to be the sponsor for the child, it's going to take several weeks and we have to get proof of address and run her background check. And, and, and these are, of course, children who were taken from her. They were kidnapped from her by the administration. And now she's having to go through these incredible hurdles to get the children back and it's going to take weeks. Um, have parents been deported without their children? Yes, I mean, there was, uh, the New York Times reported yesterday that of the, of the small group of children under five, which is a like 100 small kids, fraction, what I understand, right. but 100. 11 of those parents were deported without their kids. So I imagine that it's over 100 yeah. of the whole group. Is that been your experience? Yeah, I mean, we've, I mean, certainly through the reporting, at least dozens and dozens of parents have been uh, deported without their kids. And so now their kids are in sort of stuck in this system of, of either the Office of Refugee Resettlement or of child welfare. So We only have a few minutes left, and I, I want you both to help people watching understand where we are with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think some of the misconceptions are, and, and what would you like people to know about what's happening with these families that you're dealing with every single day? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I, I worry that sort of the news cycle is winding down on this and people are going to see, okay, the judge ordered reunification and, and now that now it's happening and we can move on. Um, there are still thousands of children 
who have not been reunified with their families. Um, and we need to stay on this administration until all of those families are reunited, no matter how long it takes. And we need to be watching out for what's coming next. Um, is the administration going to continue to attempt to do you know, indefinite family detention? Um, what's coming next? Because I, I'm certain that you know, this is not over. And so I think the, the most important thing is just don't move on. Don't let it go and, and turn to the next thing. Which is easy to do in yeah. our 24-hour news cycle. We're always hearing about different stories, different stories, and, and this is your life's work. So, um, and it's, it's important work. What would you like people to know, Bob? Well, I think one of the heartening things, I mean, this is obviously, I think, one of the hardest stories, one of the hardest things that uh, in the 15 years that I've been working on this issue. Um, but I think one of the, the positive things is that we have seen this outpouring of support from the community. Um, and so I would agree with Kate to stay involved, to stay engaged, find an organization like Grassroots Leadership or another uh, to get involved in, to um, that we have a, a bond fund, right, for women to get actually get out of Hutto that has been uh, bonding people out basically every day for the last week, um, uh, and to, to, to stay focused on what might be next. I mean, the, the administration put out a request for information uh, two weeks ago for 12,000 family detention beds, um, probably to be located on military bases. So we're looking at perhaps the, the largest trend of locking up families together on military bases or on detention camps and Japanese internment, right? So, you know, the fight is definitely not over, um, and uh, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, and so I think uh, staying engaged and getting involved is, is the most important thing. If I could just add, I just, um, Grassroots Leadership is a really great organization, and so there's lots of places to give, but um, my personal experience with them, I mean, beyond what the work we've done together over the years. I had two clients um, bond out last week from Hutto, both separated moms, uh, neither of whom had money to pay for their bonds or their plane tickets to fly to where their children were. And grassroots leadership paid for all of that, um, you know, on a moment's notice. So they really do put that money to good use. So a, a plug for the organization. Yeah. Well, maybe what we'll do at, when we, you know, repost this and share it is give folks a list of some of the organizations locally that are that are doing work towards helping these, these families like grassroots leadership. Great. Bob Leibel, Kate. Lincoln Goldfinch, thank you so much for giving us this very personal perspective because you were on the front lines, you've been on the front lines of this issue for a long time, and, and we certainly appreciate you sharing your stories with us today. Thank you. And thank you all for watching this afternoon. Ben Philpott's on vacation. He'll be back in just a couple of weeks. And we're here every Tuesday at 1230 for Capital Coffee Talk, shining the light on issues you care about local and statewide. So make it a great day. Try to, try to stay cool out there.